So many. Which of you is dyslexic? <laughs> Because I can't let that sentence go without, you know, mo some explanation. You you said you became an architect because you're dyslexia. Yes. How? Why did you say that? It's you know, I don't know how many architects are here, but architects... Oh, there are quite a few. And, and yeah, uh, they don't read. Architects look for at photos, and if they tell you otherwise, they're... <laughs> no, actually, it's true. Um, I have just read the research lately that dyslexic people are better artists and better architects, visually, let's say, visually, because we substitute. I know from myself, because I am a slow reader, huh? When you have a handicap, dyslexia is a handicap, you sort of depend on hearing things more, seeing things more. So yep, your substitute, your slow. Uh, now, not every architect is dyslexic. <laughs> but I think that a lot of people who go into art and architecture, I bet you if we do a research, there will be a high percentage of dyslexia. But this is just an impression. But it improved your visual sense. Is that what you're yes. saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, one of our books is called Menopausal Palestine. Can you explain why you called it that? And why you're so fascinated by menopausal women? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for those architects of you, I have brought three pamphlets about Riwak, so I'm going to put them here. Feel free to look at them, share them, take them. They're all yours. I'm sorry I don't have more. Um, so what was in a puzzle Palestine? Yeah, actually, this the original title of this book was "No Sex in the City," <laughs> and that city is Ramallah. It's not New York. But my, as Ritu knows very well, I always I have uh, my first publisher is an Italian publisher, and he happens to be a he. So when I told him that I want to call the book Monopausal Palestine, he said, Saad, we lose 50% of our audience. Would you, would you buy a book if that has monopause on it, no. personally? No. Ah, no. You see? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Actually, not. <laughs> he told me that. He said, I, won't, I will not call it menopause. No man, I would not buy a book. So thanks to Ritu being a feminist, she picked up that. But coming back to the title, whether it's No Sex in the City or Menopausal Palestine, actually it's a play on the situation of Palestine. This book was written right after the election of Hamas in 2006. And I can say you, that you, I... You say in, in the book that yeah. you went into a state of deep depression yes. when Hamas got it. Yes. So Can you also elaborate yeah, yeah. on that? Right. You see, I grew up. I grew up in a Middle East that have changed so much on me. When I grew up as a little girl, you know, really, really, my father was a leftist, I must say, and religion was not such an issue. It was not as, you know, we all have many layers in our personality. If you ask me, sometimes I would say I, I, my identity is a woman. Sometimes I would say I'm a Mediterranean. I may say I'm an Arab, I may say I am a um, Palestinian. And you know, what happens when we were kids, religion, religion was not an issue. And in the case of Palestine, particularly because of occupation, there were many friends of mine, I didn't know whether they were Christian, whether they're Muslims and what have you. So religion was not an issue. And it was very disheartening. I belong to the PLO generation, and the PLO is a very secular movement. And when Hamas was elected, I was disheartened because they were democratically elected. It's not that they cheated and they won. It was very heartbreaking for me to, under, to see why did the Palestinians go and voted for a religious party. And from that moment, I just felt this place is not mine. This is not my upbringing. This is not my ideas of thinking. But I also realized that the PLO at that time also had problems. People went to vote for Hamas because it was an alternative. And the PLO has ceased to serve the population, if you want. So menopausal Palestine is talking about that period. And what I have decided to express, okay, the PLO is losing grounds. And I try to make a, a play that the Palestine and the PLO are going through menopause. 
What does that mean? When a woman goes through a menopause, they start feeling, why am I not so attractive as I was before? Do I have admirers anymore or not? We lose our confidence a little bit. So there are a lot of things that are related to menopause. And the PLO is like, just like that. Palestine was being menopausal as far as I'm concerned. And here is a new mo movement called Hamas that is becoming more. And the only way I could tell myself and the world who we are is through my women friends, all the women of my generation who were active within the PLO. And these women were secular were very active on the women issue, on the social issue, in the international issue, political issues, whether it was Vietnam at one point or South Africa. And when I, the only way I could get hold of who I was at this moment is to go and interview my women friends, all the, those who have been active in the movement. Which is why this book, uh, all the chapters are about your friends. And yes. The story is told through women characters who are her friends. And actually, I just want to share with you because... Okay, before that, can we just come back to Hamas? And uh, mm -hmm. was the change only because people uh, were disillusioned with the PLO? Or was there a fundamental change in the way people looked at religion? Both, actually. But I would say the following, that the issue of the left is, an, is a is something that the whole world is facing. Most of the world, you know, the world has changed between the 70s and the 80s, and the globalization and the younger generation and what have you. So I think that on the one hand, what did the PLO promise its people? The PLO promised its people as a solution, a two-state solution for that matter. And the Israelis purposely undermined Arafat, undermines uh, Abu Mazen now. So because they could not deliver the people, they could not deliver to the people the state they were talking about. But also there were other problems within the PLO. You know, when you move from being a revolutionary movement into an establishment, and also the the, the agreement of Oslo were very difficult on the Palestinians on certain issues that people were not happy about it. So they were a combination of things. But also you have to remember that this happens after September 11. And if you ask me if there was any person on this earth that contributed to fundamentalism, I would tell you it is somebody called Bush. Because when you attack someone, ask me, if you keep attacking as I said, I am layered, you know. If you keep attacking Palestinians, 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 the one identity that comes forward is being Palestinian. What Bush did is attack Arabs, 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 Why Muslim, Bush, Muslim. Why don't you talk about Israel? Because surely the fact of Israel and, and the way that uh, it, the state has treated Palestinians, yes. surely... That made Palestinians go back to religion, maybe. A religious identity rather than a secular identity. Yeah, yeah. I, this is what I meant. Because the PLO, which is a secular movement, could not bring them what they have promised. But you have to see also Palestine in the international context. We are very much affected in what happens around us. And I think that the Israelis purposely, because the Israelis don't want a solution. We have discovered, I tell you, I was a member of the negotiation team in Washington between 91 and 93. I had a political hat I wore at one time. The Israelis, without international pressure, are not going to give us a piece of the cake. They're not. It's like South Africa. They were not going to give the blacks anything unless they were forced. Now, Israel, with the support of the Americans, we always thought, you know, I came from Jaffa, and I always thought I want to go. It's only normal that you want to go to your father's house. Huh? But with a lot of political education from the PLO, I was convinced, like many Palestinians, that we have to settle for the two-state solution. And when it was offered to the Israelis, we thought they're going to jump on it. They always say, we want a Jewish state. Okay, here you are, have your own state. They don't want it. They want greater Israel. But Israel, by undermining the PLO, 
The people want another alternative, and the only political party that existed and exists in the Arab world, unfortunately today, are the Muslim Brothers. So they grab. The same thing happened in Egypt. They are the only political party. No matter how you have people are democratic and open, if you don't have a party, how do, how does, how do you grab power? And I think the lack of leftist party in the Arab world and in Palestine uh, has given, but also not only in Palestine. You have seen how the Arab world has moved into uh, religion. So unfortunately, religion had become uh, the new uh, identity for many sure. nations. Has, has Palestine changed culturally because of this? It's, uh, you know, I, I, actually my hope is culture. I always say culture is more powerful than anything. In other words, whether a woman is like me, unveiled, or a woman is veiled, the culture there is not that different. Sometimes we get a little bit scared of appearance. Because what does culture mean? The emotions, the relations, the music, the way we dress. In one family in Palestine, if you come to Palestine, you will find the communist and one which is Fatah and the other one is a Hamas. And at the end of the day, they listen to the same music, they eat the same food. So many times I say, I see religion today as nationalism at one point. Uh, so I don't like it because I was not brought up in this way. But I think with alternatives, thanks to history, things change. Otherwise, we will not be hopeful. Shall we come to your book? Yes, please do. <laughs> so tell me, uh, you started writing about your friends, and these are very chatty stories. They, they, are, they are all non-fiction, mm -hmm. but they're like stories. Mm -hmm. so what made you do that? Actually, it's very interesting. When I went to interview my woman friends, I wanted them to talk about what you and I are talking about. The serious stuff. The serious stuff right. of belonging to the PLO, to an open movement. These are women who, move, who were active in the women movement. Those are women who left their homes and joined the PLO. One thing that amazed me, I realized that none of these women are Palestinians. You know what I mean? I never thought, I have a friend called Vera. Vera is Vera for me. I never thought Vera is Armenian and Vera is from Aleppo and Vera is Christian and Vera is from middle class. Vera is Vera. For me, she was a member of the Democratic Front, full stop. You know what I mean? We argued on politics. So it was amazing for me. When I went to talk with these women, they were so tired of the communal story, of the shared story, how do you say, the collective history of the PLO. When you become political, and I'm sure many of you have become political, the cause become more important than the personal story, especially if we come from a middle class of or bourgeois family and you are leftist, you try to act as if you come from a peasant's uh, background or you are a working class and you are in denial. I tell you, this is the first time maybe ever I show my, fa my mother's house in Damascus. I never showed it, I never shared it, because I would not be a right, the, the right leftist if I came from a rich family. So there was a lot of denial in us. It's not like here I am, you have to accept me as I am, and I am a leftist in addition to my baggage, you know. When I went to meet my women friends, all they were interested in is to tell about their personal life, about their childhood, about their family. They really wanted to be in touch with their individual human beings. And that's why the book became more about their childhood. Actually, the book starts when they were little kids, and I became interested in the moment when we become aware and become leftist. Why did these people support Palestine? What happened in their life? One is in Tunis, Tunis, one is in Egypt, one is in Aleppo, one is in Damascus, one is American, one is in uh, Italian. What brought these people together? What is the event that make us sympathize with South Africa, with another cause, we come out of our who we are and we sort of become something else. So I became interested in every single story 
I guide the reader to figure out what is it that triggers this uh, sharing with the others, feeling with the others, being with the other. And Palestine is not a cause, it's not a victory cause, it's not a fashionable thing. It is something to do with justice, it's something to do with human rights, it's something to do with our s deep sense of uh, right. And I think this is a human value. Everybody feels that there is injustice had happened to the Palestinians to create a state being thrown out of your homeland. And I wanted to capture what made these people interested in this moment. Do you think Palestine is an imaginary state? Do you think it exists in imagination more than it exists in real life? Yes. <laughs> It varies, really. It depends on the experience. I tell you about myself. I grew up as a refugee in Jordan. And refugee does not mean that you live in a camp, by the way, because even the young people in my office, when I say I'm a refugee, no, 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 you're not a refugee, because the refugee brings only negative connotation. Refugee is someone who had lost their work and their house in Palestine in 47 when Israel was uh, created. Uh, so I, I lost the thread of. Uh, <laughs> so I was asking. Yes, you, yes. Is, so Palestine exists. Exactly. In so fact I grew or in, in the imagination. In imagine. So if you grow up outside Palestine, like you have almost five million refugees live in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and all over the world. So they imagine Palestine as I did, and it is fantasized. And it is the most beautiful land on earth. And our house, and everybody was rich in Palestine before they threw of the Israel. So there is a lot of romanticizing. We all know that when you lose something, it becomes paradise. You have lost paradise. I must tell you, I came to Palestine in 81. I decided to go and teach in uh, Bir Zayt University. And my mother thought I was crazy. She said, everybody's leaving the occupation and you want to go and live under occupation. And I did. In 81, it was the first time I go to Palestine. There were things actually that I was impressed with positively, that landscape is very beautiful. It's like south of Spain, probably. It's all olives. And the landscape, the nature is something that really grabbed me. And this is why I started Riwak. But I did not find the Palestinians the most friendly nations on earth, no. Actually, also when I went to Jerusalem, I was a little kid, and my father has taken me before 67 to Jerusalem. I was not looking for the Dome of the Rock and the Aqsa Mosque or the Holy Sepulcher. I was look looking for the sweet shop that my father took me one day to this little sweet shop. So when I, I met the Palestinians, under occupation, I realized that they, were, they are very suspicious because of the long isolation, because of the long occupation, and I had an accent different from theirs. So it wasn't that easy to make friends with them. So I, so I find out that what my father used to tell me about the Palestinians was not exactly what he told. So yes, there are a lot of constructs, uh, constructions, and also, in my case, for example, my father came from Jaffa, so I was always thinking of Jaffa, 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 Jaffa. When I started writing the second book, uh, the new book, Golda Slept Here, when I was writing the book, I realized actually my family was thrown out of Jerusalem, but they never talked about Jerusalem. So some reality was taken out. So to answer your question, yes, a lot of it because we live through the memories of our parents. And if, you, if I have a child now, I would only describe the beauty of nature. And, and in a sense, all of you are refugees, isn't that so? Pardon? In a sense, all of you are refugees. Yes, 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 yes. yeah. And that's what contributes to this imaginary land. Right. Now in your new book, uh, this is a proof copy. Oh, I'm sorry. I I'd, I'd, I'd like you to read two passages because I think that gives a flavor of the writing and also it tells us something about uh, 
what Palestine is, what Israel is, the relationship. I'll tell you which passages. Can I ask you, I never read, by the way, because of my dyslexia. Oh, I yes. always disappoint the, re the uh, listeners. So I'm going to ask you to read okay. these two pages. <laughs> Shall we introduce the, or you would rather? Uh, yeah. Can you find it for me? Which one? I, I want the uh, new museum. Gabby and the other, the absentee landlord. So here is the museum, This is about Gabby. Yes. Can you explain very yeah, yeah. clearly, Gabby? Okay. Um, you know, I, I uh, always, I'm always accused by this cousin that I speak a lot and give the, and never give you time to uh, uh, enough. But here I am. I want to explain to you what this book is all about. This book really, mm, thank you. Uh, Golda slept here. Uh, Golda Meir lived here, in other words. This is a house that belongs to a friend of mine called George Sharat. And this house is in West Jerusalem. I don't know how many of you know that the, in 1948, Jerusalem was divided into